Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ryan Bijan, host of Cowtown Movie Classics, and 2024 sees the 85th anniversary of Hollywood's golden year. In 1939, the studios were pumping out a masterpiece every week, from Mr. Smith Goes to Washington and The Hunchback of Notre Dame, to The Wizard of Oz, Gone with the Wind. Tonight's film certainly deserves its spot in that pantheon of essential classics. From legendary director John Ford, it's the original Stagecoach, with an ensemble cast featuring Claire Trevor, Thomas Mitchell, John Carradine, and in the role that made him a global superstar, John Wayne. Joining us tonight is a fellow film fan who's heavily involved with the John Wayne Cancer Foundation. She also happens to be the Duke's first and favorite granddaughter. Please give a warm welcome to Anita Swift. How are you doing tonight, Anita? Hi, Ryan, I'm doing great doing fabulous. Now, most of us, we know John Wayne, the icon, the symbol. He's the image. He's the personification of rugged American masculinity. Now, I know you get this question asked all the time, but what was John Wayne the man like? What was he like in person as a human being? Well, you know, really, and, and I say this all the time, but he, what you saw was what you got. I mean, he was that person he, he was uh true to his word he was the the cowboy way i mean whether he was on a horse or on foot he was true to his word and um and, you know he was a manly man i mean you just wanted to cuddle up to him and and hug him and men wanted to be around him i mean he was uh just a big giant guy and just you know, you just wanted to be like him. He was, um, uh, he was a good guy, you know? Even when he was being naughty, he was good, you know? Um, in those movies where he played the bad guy, he was just a little bit good, you know? Um, when he was um, Dunstan in uh, Red River, he, you know, he just, he was bad enough that he was good. When he was Ethan Edwards, he was bad, but you knew he was gonna end up being good. He wasn't gonna kill that little girl, you know? And um, all those things, you know, you just knew he was a good man at heart and, um, and true to his word and just, uh, you know, I mean, I loved him as a grandfather and he was, and he was a good dad, you know, um, you can ask all of his kids. He was the best. Oh, I absolutely believe it. You guys all turned out pretty well. So I imagine he was a good, good father. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, yeah. What was your first exposure to the film Stagecoach? Do you remember seeing it for the first time? We were lucky. We were very lucky. We got to, um, you know, he screened movies at his house. And so we got to see the, you know, all those movies up close and personal with him sitting in the room. You know, we were all cheering and, and, you know, and he would say things, you know, he would say things because he'd see him and he'd say, oh, you know, I threw a bad punch there. Or, you know, he'd see the weird things in there. But, you know, he'd also call out the good stuff. Like, did you see me twirl that gun or did you, do you notice we had to cut, you know, six inches off that gun and we had to put on an, a loop on that gun. And so you'd see all those really cool things, too, that that happened, you know, in the in or, or he'd go, yeah, there's Yakima, you know, going under that you know, wagon or. So you'd also get all the really cool background stuff on the. Uh, uh, movies too. So that was, that was always neat too. So when you're watching these movies, are you like, granddad, shut up. I want to watch the film. Totally, totally. Like, don't, don't ruin it for us. Come on. You know, but also it was neat. It was also neat to get the background stuff too, because it's like, you know, you know, these horses are falling down and everything. And it's like, we're like, Oh, did the horse get hurt? And he's, he's telling us, Oh no, those, those are horses that are trained to fall like that, you know? Right. And it was certainly a different industry in 1939. Your grandfather cut his teeth 
fine tuning and perfecting this cowboy persona, this image. So even though Stagecoach, it seems like, oh, he's he's coming onto the scene fully formed. He had a decade to develop this image. And how much of that image was your grandfather? How much of it was the input of John Ford, the director? Well, what's it, very interesting is, you know, when he was uh, 23 years old, he was a star of The Big Trail. Uh, Raoul Walsh directed him in that movie. And, you know, he was 23 years old. And so then he had like 10 years to perfect all these other things. And he worked with an amazing group of men who were stuntmen and wranglers. And, and so he learned how to, through all these other B movies, he learned how to ride a horse and he learned what horse to ride. Because if you see him in these B movies, you know, they put him on like a Shetland pony in a couple of these movies. So, you know, here's this guy who's six foot three who was riding a little tiny horse. And, it, you know, I mean, that he could practically walk while he was riding these horses. So it's, it's so funny to see him go from that kind of a character. And then, you know, he's shooting a gun like sideways and you know he learned how to, he really fine-tuned his craft with the help of these stuntmen and wranglers um yakima Kanet, who was a, an amazing uh rodeo uh cowboy uh um you know top cowboy bronc buster uh all-around cowboy uh champion um taught him how to ride a horse and you know, jump, get, get on a horse and off a horse and look like a pro. And, um, and, uh, Paul Fix, uh, Harry Carey, Ben Johnson, all those guys taught him how to really look like a pro on a horse. And, and Yakima and he, uh, perfected, uh, uh, fights, you know, those cowboy fights in movies. Yeah. So that by the time by the time he was making these movies for John Ford, he was he was an amazing, really stunt cowboy. And so, you know, I think John Ford uh, was a lucky director to get him. It's my understanding was John Ford sort of discovered John Wayne on the lot in the early days in the late 1920s. But what took so long for them to get together and make a movie? I mean, he's the one who told Raul Walsh, hire that guy, use him in this movie. Um, and I think that, you know, he, he used him as an extra in a, you know, a bunch of movies, but I think he had his eye on my grandfather. He knew he was going to use him. And I think he waited until it was right. right. And the, and stagecoach was the perfect film. Here's this story about these seven characters going to Lordsburg. Each one of them had a great story. And it was the perfect coming out film for my grandfather. My grandfather was only 30, 33 or something in this movie. I mean, what a handsome dude. What a, what a great story. Each one of them had a great story. John Carradine. Um, you know, they were all so fabulous in that movie. And, you know, I mean, what a, what a walk on for him, you know, twirling that gun. Hold on. You know, I mean, just fabulous. That has to be one of the greatest establishing shots of any character in movie history. Uh, exactly. And I mean, I talk about Ford gave him that shot. And then gave him the, the walkout shot on the searchers. I mean, two of the most iconic shots. And I mean, this, the, um, stagecoach is, you know, AFI's, you know, top movie, uh, the searchers, you know, they're all in the top, you know, 100 movies. And, and yet John Ford never got an Oscar for a Western film. He got three Oscars, never got an Oscar for one of his Westerns. It's just blows my mind. Well, I think it's inconceivable now. I think Westerns are held in a much higher esteem. But probably back then, there was still a stigma. You know, Western, science fiction, horror, 
they were probably seen as pulp, disposable entertainment, whereas, of course, totally. now we know they're worth more than that. E- exactly. No, totally. Totally. So for anyone in the audience who may be familiar with the image of John Wayne, but they've never seen Stagecoach before, what do they have to look forward to? It's a great story. I mean, you've got, you've got, you know, the doctor who's, you know, the drunk doctor. You've got the, the, the uh, lady of the evening who turns out to, you know, save the day for the, the you've got the pregnant wife of the military person. You've got the card shark, uh, John Carradine, who turns out to be more of a crook than the actual criminal. You know, my grandfather, who's the the criminal that's, you know, they they take his gun away the minute he's, you know, in the in the stagecoach. You've got Andy Devine, the goofy stagecoach driver. You've got the sheriff. Um, gosh, who am I leaving out? Um, there's seven seven of them in there. Um, What's well, an amazing cast? They, they all have. It's an amazing cast. It, it, it's a great story. Oh, and they're all going. It's you're going through Indian territory. Yeah. So you know it's 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 going to be a longer stagecoach ride than it has to be because they've got to go. You know they they've got to go through an area that's you know kind of around the Indian territory. But you know in the end the the criminal is going to save the day, <laughs> you know, and it's going to be, end up being a, a great, it's a great story. It's, uh, you know, through beautiful Monument Valley, you know, which was insane to get to. They had to get all those people up to Monument Valley to film. Um, it wasn't like they could just fly up there and do it. Um, uh, but it was, gosh, the scenery is beautiful. Um, the characters are terrific. Right. There's some incredible location shooting. And it's something we take for granted today. But back then, when you, when you watch a lot of these Westerns, at that time, you could tell they were shot on the studio back lot. It was an indoor sound stage and the, with the artificial lighting. But you see some of the shots in Stagecoach. They're doing that stuff for real. They're there. Oh, yeah. Monument yeah, that- the Andy Devine, uh, you know, with the stagecoach, I think, wasn't it Barry Corbin that told the story of um, Andy Devine? They told they told John Ford, oh, you need to give him, um, you know, have somebody stand there with the holding, you know, the other side of the reins so he doesn't look like a doofus. But yeah, they didn't listen to him. <laughs> so he, he does kind of look like a dork. But. Um, you know, it, that was probably the only thing that really was kind of goofy, but, um, but it works as part that, of the charm. It works. It works. And, you know, um, about 10 years ago, a friend of mine gave me a Frederick Remington, um, book of his pictures. And I'm telling you those scenes, some of those scenes are directly taken from Remington's works. Um, you know, John Ford was one of those guys who wanted everything to be perfect and everything to look like it was historically correct. And really, I mean, you, you see some of those shots and it, it, it looks just like it just came out of a Remington painting. Mm-hmm. He wanted it to be so perfect. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because, again, even when we think of like sort of the literary predecessors of the Western film, You have these Western pulp novels, these dime novels, these magazine stories, and you have uh, artists like Frederick Remington, Charles M. Russell. They took that imagery of the Wild West and they really elevated it to an art form in the way John Ford would on film. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, Ford was such a stickler. And it's interesting, if you'll notice, every character in this movie has their own theme song. Um, it's so funny. I mean, like every character has it. Every time they appear on the screen, they have their own theme song when they're in the stagecoach. If you're in the audience, please stick around after the film so you can hear the rest of our conversation. Without further ado, from 1939, director John Ford's Stagecoach. To me, this is still an incredible experience 85 years later. You know what? It's so funny because I didn't I didn't notice the the songs for each of the characters until I listened to it again. 
I mean, until I watched it again. And I was listening, uh, you know, every time they were, when they were driving, it was like John Carradine kind of had a creepy uh, song with him. And then um, the, the, um, the pregnant girl had, you know, like a, my darling Clementine. And then the, the barmaid was like, Claire Trevor was like, you know, it was hysterical. Well, that's when we think about these great movies, like all, like even in 1939, like I said, Gone with the Wind, Wizard of Oz, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Oh my God, I know, right? It's incredible. But you look at each one of these films, if you break down the elements, it's not like, oh, this movie had a good screenplay. This movie had a good photography. This one had good act. I mean, each one of these films, on every level, they were successful. On every level, these were incredibly well made. I mean, the Wizard of Oz, for goodness sakes, when yeah. that turns into color, it's like, Wah! I mean, uh, we used to watch it every Thanksgiving, it would be on. And it was like, it was still, when it turned into color, it still was like, oh my God, it's color. All right. So if you're in the audience and you're curious of where I'm at, I am sitting in the middle of John Wayne, an American experience located in the Fort Worth stockyards. And right behind me, these are actual screen-used costumes worn by John Wayne in many of his most iconic films. Anita, how did this incredible museum first come about? So we were in this um, at the NFR um, just before COVID started, and we had a little tiny kind of uh, traveling exhibit at the South Point, and Patrick Gotch. Uh, came in and saw it and said, you need to be in the stockyards. And so Ethan, Ethan Wayne, uh, my uncle, said, okay. Um, and it developed from there. And so we moved all of our memorabilia down to Texas, where it t definitely needed to be. And we moved into this space um, kind of in the middle of COVID. And uh, we opened a, a six or 8,000 square foot, or no, let me see, 6,000 square foot space. And then we just added another 4,000 square feet on, but it houses um, some of some amazing memorabilia. And it shows the uh, path that my grandfather took to Hollywood, and it encompasses um, his uh, all of his life, his um, uh, movie life, his personal life, his family life, um, and his um, you know his uh, everything, all the awards he's he did, and plus his legacy of um, trying to find a, a of us trying to find a cure for cancer using his image and likeness. And so uh, this is all stuff that was in storage. Um, when my um, uncle Michael uh, took over, or when my grandfather died, um, my uncle Michael was uh, running everything and, and then he passed away and Ethan took over. And, and we had, I think like 23, of those big pods just filled with stuff. And it took him about seven years to go through everything. But, and there was a lot of junk in there, but there was a lot of treasure. And um, this is just a, a smidgen of what was in there. But we, we take things out and put it in and, you know, transfer stuff out. We just, put a lot of new stuff in. Um, so if you've been here before, come back because we have a lot of new stuff. And um, it's amazing, I think. Yeah, it's always a fun experience. I've been fortunate enough to come here a few times and it seems like every time I come, I'm discovering something a little bit different. I'm looking at things from a different perspective. And you guys have an amazing gift shop too. It seems like you're always updating the merchandise. So there's always a lot of cool John Wayne memorabilia. I've got my Ringo Kid shirt on. <laughs> but we, yeah, we do. We have a lot of fun stuff. Um, that's our only brick and mortar store. We do have an online store too, but um, it uh, it's uh, been a lot of fun. 
It's the perfect spot for it. Um, you know, it's amazing to us that he still has the same gravity, uh, same popularity that he held, um, you know, almost now 50 years ago. Um, and, uh, he's, you know, still popular. Um, his movies are still popular. He is still an American icon. Um, and I think it's because he, he, he really can, he's withstood the test of time. He, his movies are, uh, still things that you can take your kids and grandkids to. You don't have to cover their eyes or ears, you know, uh, there's nothing nasty in there and he, he, it's always a good story you know now we touched upon this a little bit earlier john wayne eventually succumbed and passed away to cancer um but like you said in his name the family has established the john wayne cancer foundation would you talk a little bit about your involvement with the foundation sure so when he found out he had terminal cancer he um, sold the rights to his image and likeness and name uh, to his his children and said, you need to find a cure for cancer. And so since 1981, we have been doing that. Uh, we have established the John Wayne Cancer Foundation and we have been training surgical oncologists uh, since that time. So we've trained over 160 surgical oncologists and those are doctors. So they've been, you know, they've become doctors and they take an extra two years, uh, and learn how to, um, you know, uh, they train two more years to become surgical oncologists, which means they're not going to go in and cut your leg off if you have leg cancer or liver cancer, or they're not going to go in and take everything out that they possibly can. They're going to become precision trained surgeons. Okay. Which means that your recovery is going to be a lot better. So we've trained those 160 surgeons. They touch at least a hundred uh, patients a year, which means, you know, they've, they've touched a lot of people since we started. And so we are very, you know, proud of that. And in the, in the museum, you'll see the list of those surgeons and where they are located. And they are located throughout the world, not just this country. And, um, and then they also, as part of their training, do research and we have um uh we are proud that we have developed the sentinel node biopsy and we are also we we also have a program called block the blaze which um trains uh we've trained over half a million junior lifeguards and um young kids um to spot a spot uh, melanoma, because that is one of the biggest killers of people, especially in the Southwest. So, you know, that's, we're really proud about that too. And if, if people want to know more about our program and our um, fundraising events, um, they can go on to johnwayne.org to find out more about that. But we are, um, particularly, we partner with um, Texas Tech and UCI in um, California um, with those um, programs, with the surgical oncology programs. So um, yeah, we're super proud about that. No, absolutely. It's such an incredible legacy. My understanding was John Wayne helped a lot of people in his own lifetime, and here we are 50 years later, and he's still helping even more people. Exactly. And, and that's, as a family, we do not want to you know, go up to heaven and have him look at us and say what the hell were you doing you know <laughs> yeah i told you to do this so yeah we're 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 very proud of that and and i know he would be too um he's you know that's that was you know he beat he beat lung cancer 
and then he got this weird stomach cancer so that we just he just couldn't find in time but um you know he he was the first person to say the big c and he was the, and he actually you know in those days you didn't you didn't want to say you had cancer because uh you could get you know your insurance was canceled so so and you know when you were making a movie you had to have your insurance so but he was very truthful about it so yeah he was always very truthful about his sicknesses and stuff at that time did your grandfather ever speak publicly or did he have an opinion like say in the 1960s and 70s with his new the sergio leone spaghetti westerns the um the sam peck and paul wild bunch type when the genre started to get a little bit more rough and violent did he have an opinion on that well you know i think he uh, he watched him he he you know i'm he certainly en you know enjoyed him but you know he was never going to be in those he right. never you know he was never going to he was never going to be in those because you know he wanted to make movies he could take his kids to his grandkids um that that they, they would enjoy he he just wasn't going to be in them i mean uh, i think steven spielberg wanted him to be in uh 1941 was that 1941 the, yes yeah, yeah. yeah he wanted to play the general in that and stuff and he said hey this is a great movie but i'm not going to be in it because yeah i can't take my kids to go see it i'll go see it but i can't take my kids to see it you know my kids can't go see it so i you know i can't i'm not going to do it which you know he definitely stuck to his guns he was a man of conviction yeah absolutely I, you know he knew his limits as an actor, you know, he knew he wasn't going to be, you know, he wasn't ever going to do a ballet movie. He wasn't ever going to be able to be a, he, he, he would try to be a Cary Grant character, but, you know, he knew he wasn't, he wasn't anything but what he was, you know, so he wasn't ever going to try and, and, and do that. And, um, you know, I think he stayed true to himself. And he, he was a good, he was a good actor. He just wasn't going to be what he wasn't. You right. Know, he wasn't a method actor. He wasn't a, any of that, you know. But I mean, obviously he was the best at what he did. He was, he knew what Absolutely. he was Absolutely. He knew what he was capable of. I feel like I have to mention this. Obviously growing up when you did, you were able to know John Ford a little bit. And so what was he like? Well, he was always nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was like a grumpy grandpa, you know. Um, but, you know, he was very nice. Uh, uh, he, he, he was, you know, just kind of a grumpy guy. Uh, very much, you know, he had like a big Christmas party every year. Um, but I'll say one thing, my grandfather loved him, loved him. And um, when when we went to uh, his funeral, yeah, I, look, I, I went to many funerals with my grandfather and that funeral, my grandfather cried. And, um, you know, his, his brother had just died and I didn't see him cry as much as I did at, uh, at uh, John Ford's funeral, yeah, he was he was very upset at that funeral. So, yeah. So the love was definitely real, and I'm glad that they still appreciate oh, each yeah. other, even in the end. Oh yeah, no, he loved him, loved him. One of my favorite actors in the film, he's one of my all time favorite actors, is John Carradine, and I know he's stuck oh, around yeah. for a while. Did you ever know John Carradine or his sons? So I, I did know, I do know Bobby Carradine, um, and he's great. Um, and you know, John Carradine was in Stagecoach and in, um, was he in, uh, Liberty Balance too? I think he, he was, was in a lot of, it, he it's was been in a, a bunch of, he was in a bunch of movies with my grandfather. He, and his, he was also in The Shootist. He was in his last movie. So, you know, perfect part, The Undertaker. 
Um, and then, um, uh, so Bobby tells the story about, um, so Bobby was in the Cowboys, one of my very favorite movies. Cause I just, oh, I was, you know, the same age as all those Cowboys. So, uh, it had a huge crush on all of them. And so Bobby tells a story about, you know, his first day on the set with, uh, working and his dad calls him and says, you know, how was, how was your first day? You know, you know, how was Duke? How was your first day? And Bobby says, well, uh, you know, I, I gave Duke a couple of acting tips. And so Bobby goes, well, my father burst out laughing and was like, oh, yeah, I'm sure you gave Duke a couple. What did Duke say? You know, he says, well, you know, I told him how to react to me. And, and you know, and, and John Carradine was just like, oh, I bet that went over big. You know, what did, what did Duke do? You know? And, and Bobby goes, well, he was, he was very open, to, you know, and he, Bobby's like acting, you know, like, oh, he went very, you know, he was very open to all the suggestions I gave and stuff. And so, you know, John Carradine called my grandfather and, and, and said, oh, I heard Bobby was giving you some acting tips, you know, and, and my grandfather said, oh yeah, he was full of shit. You know, <laughs> he was, yeah. He was, yeah, he gave me a few tips, just like you, you know. <laughs> they had no, a good love, laugh. No, I love John Carradine. I'm a big Universal Horror fan, so to me, he's Dracula, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, he's a perfect Dracula, isn't he? And, he, and even in Stagecoach, he looks like Dracula with the black cloak and the mustache. Oh, my God, totally. I mean, he's, he always did. I mean, he, it didn't matter what part he was playing. He just always Yes, the, the gaunt cheekbones. Well, yeah. you know, I told you I grew up in the San Fernando Valley. and Yes. Yeah. Um, so Elsa Lancaster and Charles Lawton. Oh, my God. They, so they were married, right? Yes. Yeah, they yeah. lived across the street from us when I was growing up. And they, yeah, and they had this donkey that lived in their, um, in their house. They had a big house that went up a hill. And so we used to go over and feed their donkey every day, you know, and it was like, I'm telling you, where we lived was like heaven. I mean, there were, there were people that were in the movie business all over our, our, our area that, cause you know, they all, the studios were all around. So they, all these, they had, there were all these big, huge pieces of property that, that everybody lived on. But can you imagine living across the street from, the Bride of Frankenstein and the Hunchback of, oh, the Hunchback of Notre Dame. <laughs> Bride of Frankenstein is in my like, top five movies, a like, top ten movies of all time. Crazy. Charles Lawton, incredible, incredible performer. So do you have any upcoming events at the museum that you want us to look forward to? Sure, we do. Um, July 27th, we are going to um, kind of christen the, the um, uh, addition that we just put on. Um, and so it's going to, I'm going to be there. Marisa Wayne is going to be there. John Wayne's youngest daughter, my aunt. Um, and my cousin, Laura will be there. And my cousin, Jennifer Wayne will be there. She's in the group, uh, runaway June. She's a singer and Ethan will be there. So we'll all be there on the 27th and, um, we'll be christening the new edition so right. um everybody come on out well i'm super excited i know i'm certainly looking forward to it uh, do you have any closing thoughts on the film is there anything else you would like us to know about or i can I, I know that it was you know one of my grandfather's very favorite you know any movie he worked with john ford in was uh one you know just a, a treasure to him because first of all john ford loved to make movies, loved to be historically accurate. And my grandfather, I don't know if many people know this or not, but my grandfather was a huge history buff. He just, he loved history, especially, he loved Winston Churchill. He loved uh, the Civil War. Um, he, and, and he loved um, American Indian tribes. He just loved it, loved all of 
all of that, American history, just loved it all. Um, and, uh, and Native American art was, uh, a, he was a huge collector. So, and he left all his Native American art to the um, uh, National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum in Oklahoma. So, awesome. yeah, people can go see it there. <laughs> but um, that's, he, I don't know if people know that about him. But he, So he loved it when he made movies with John Ford because Ford was such a history kind of nut about stuff. So, so they, got, they got along very well. They did. Oh, yeah, they did. I mean, you know, Ford could be a a jerk, but a jerk like he was your dad, you know, and, you know, who gets along with their parents all the time? Not me. That's right. <laughs> Anita Swift, once again, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Ryan. I'm happy, happy to have this conversation with you always. Well, thank you so much. If you're in the audience, I hope you enjoyed the film as much as we did. Once again, my name is Ryan Bijan. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>